you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. There are ladies things that makes it official. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. As always, the Chris Voss Show is a family that loves you, but doesn't judge you, at least then as harshly as your family. Because, you know, your family knows you well. Uh, but the beautiful part is we're a family that loves you in spite of all your flaws and, and the things about you. But just don't ask for, for us for money. That's all we ask. As always, we have the most amazing authors from all the top publishers across the board on The Chris Voss Show. And they just keep coming every day, two to three shows for 16 years now going on. The end of this month, August 2024, 2,000 shows plus. Go back and watch them all. Just binge them. And when you get done, just binge them again. It's fun. She is the author of the latest book that comes out that came out march 18th 2024 it's called whispers sinners and saints by nancy hart it could be an autobiography of myself but i'm sure it's a work of her own fiction so nancy will be joining us on the show to talk about all of her stuff sinners and saints did i do the same part or i just do the center part i don't know both you did both (laughs) and it's an autobiography you were right about that it's not there you fiction. Go. It's totally true. Yeah, every there you word go. of it. Sinners and saints. There yeah. you go. So she is the author of the latest book. She has two more books coming out soon and still more to share. She has a recipe for happiness to exchange ideas and deep thoughts while avoiding wasting time in superficial conversations and gossip, even though she's now on the show where we'll do superficial conversations. She's traveled uh, to six out of seven continents, having grown up in Manhattan, in South Florida. She is a xenophile, preferring exposure to various cultures of the world over sand and sun. She graduated from from the University of Miami with a BA in psychology, studied art appreciation in Europe, best place to probably do that, attended Fashion Institute of Technology, including Kabbalah and Buddhism, and traveled the perimeters of the United States. The perimeters? You didn't go to the inside part? I live in the inside part right now in Colorado, huh? but uh, no, I didn't get to do the inside part. I saw huh. I did the outside part. Got a lovely flavor of all the wonderful people in our wonderful country. <laughs> Isn't it, though? We have some interesting folks. The outside yeah, flavor is kind of the crust, though. It's kind of like if you get toast and you just eat the crust part. Oh. You should try the middle. The middle is tasty. Of course, you are in Denver, and it's a wonderful middle up there. Yeah, I do like bread. All, all parts of it, though, unfortunately. <laughs> all kinds. <laughs> That's my problem. I'm a bread-dipping fiend. Yeah. So, welcome to the show. We certainly okay. appreciate you coming on, Nancy. Give us a dot .coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interweb? Which is in the okay, sky. wonderful. So, nancyhart.com. Mm-hmm. You can also find me either on YouTube, on Instagram, and Facebook. It will be Nancy Hart Author. There you go. Yeah. And give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside your book. Oh, what is inside my book? Okay, it's an intense read. It's a historical read, and uh, it's uh, to not concentrate on the negative that is going on that I talk about in the book. It's to have a light shining on that there are negative things that happen, but the negative things that happen were all hidden lessons for me to learn from. And I just got to do it a little bit earlier than other people, but I found my own tools to Mm. see that like two negatives is a positive. I think Mm. it really, it really does affect that. I think a lot of people, you know, end up in institutions, end up looking for their happiness on the bottle. In the bottle, on the bottom yeah. of the bottle. <laughs> the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> we'll see that maybe on Friday night. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good one. And maybe that'll be the next yeah. in the book. I, I like that. I like. Yeah. I actually like that title. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll have to watch this again just so I can remember that one. Mine, mine was always love at the bottom of the bottle. Love kind of at the bottom of the bottle. There you go. Yeah, uh, better. Or the, the genie's not at the bottom of the bottle. Yeah. But, Yeah. 
So the hard stuff, I write and I share about the hard stuff, totally authentic. I don't even change the name of the characters of the first book because mm-hmm. everybody's passed away, so I don't have to worry about that. Ah. And uh, and that I could have just, you know, carried on the trauma and perpetuated that that was mm-hmm. handed down to me. Mm-hmm. But instead, I'm a, what they call a transitional person, meaning I stopped it and instead cleared the path so that the future generations in our family, which is just my son and my daughter, have a clean start. They don't have to go and work out all that trauma. And I learned that this also clears past karma for the ancestors. Oh, yeah. Generational trauma is really a thing. We've had probably 200 psychologists on the show. We've, we've done a few shows. And uh, yeah, we've, it's it's definitely a real thing. At first, I thought it was kind of foo foo. I'm like, well, how does the generational trauma work? Are you, are you getting this through the chromosome? But no, it really does because it's passed down from behavior to behavior between exactly. parents and stuff. Exactly, yeah. it's yeah. what you learn, it's what you see, and then yeah. of course, then there's the genetics that occurs in it. In this book, I I talk about also my mother has Asperger, mm-hmm. and I'm a hypersensitive child, so this is not a very good cocktail and I, I go further and further into that in the second and third book mm-hmm. how that works mm-hmm. yeah sounds like you've incorporated some of your life in in into your book tell, tell us about how you grew up when did you start writing kind of know when you had that knack for writing or want to start writing i think you mentioned earlier in the green room that you start wanting to write since four but i'll let you tell your story okay great So I really had a very, very hard childhood. And I say that because I had my mother was a refugee, right, from Mm -hmm. Hungary. Mm -hmm. And I never got to know my father. I had a grandmother from age 5 to 11. But my mother was hype, very abusive, very neglectful. Mm -hmm. I write about historical part of the book is that we lost our family in the Holocaust. Oh, wow. Yeah. So my mother was a child of the Holocaust and my grandmother had the numbers on the Holocaust and it wasn't really spoken about until later. Mm-hmm. I knew, it's, my mother being very abusive, how did I know I was going to write? At age four, I had a horrific experience where she threw me out of the car oh, wow. and she beat me in front of other people. Mm-hmm. And other people would, you know, maybe maybe other kids would, I don't know. I don't know how other kids would react, but me, I always had to ask why and what is the purpose of this? I was always very curious and how do I make this into a good thing? Because this is, I, I, how do I go on in life? Mm -hmm. Like being beaten all the time, just the looks of me would get her like, like primal animal to eat the young. It was very, very strange very strange and as a child you're trying to process all that yeah you're trying to process all that why am i i this is a strange way to to be loved yes so Um, i don't have brothers and sisters Mm -hmm. yeah so i don't have a father to report to my grandmother was working hard Mm -hmm. she did the best she could and i was pushing why 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 and i was since i'm very young since even before age four I write about it in the first book, is Mm -hmm. that I would have a voice come to me. And I did go to therapy to make sure that, you know, if it was schizophrenia, (laughs) then, you know, you need your medication, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You take your medication and then uh, it's respectable. Everybody's got their own thing. And so I actually was always advised and given wisdom and guided as to how to look at things. So when this particular thing happened, he was always a he voice said, you, everything will be all right Mm -hmm. when you write. Oh. Yeah. And at four, I did not understand all right, A-L-R-I-G-H-T and (laughs) W-R-I-G-R-I-T-E. It took me a while. But when I got it, I said, that's a promise I will make. I'm going to tell everybody. There and there's got to be a purpose for it. Yeah. There you go. It sounds yeah. like it was a coping mechanism in a sort of way. Is that sound correct? 
it made me, you know, while I got beat, I kept saying, I'm going to write my book one day. And this is all for me to, I've gone to process this and what I've got to write about is, you know, at least I I don't do drugs, I don't do alcohol, I don't do, you know, the worst thing I do, I was on the phone last night and I was saying to my friend, it's nine o'clock, but yeah, I'm sorry, I'm chomping on my peanuts right now. <laughs> so I shouldn't be eating that late, you know, yes. on, but I wanted a snack. Oh, we all do that. Yeah, that's, and I that's wanted a healthy snack. thing. Yeah, yeah it's good. a healthy, like my things are usually healthy and now my addiction is writing, like, uh, like it's going out of style, I'm writing. Mm. Uh, yeah you know writing is writing is a really good solace i don't know if that's totally the right word i'm looking for it's close but it, it is a cathartic sort of thing experience i think that's what i'm looking for i find that it can be cathartic i think it's cathartic and a lot of times it's like a prayer mm. where i am channeling what needs to be done yeah and guided so i you know i know i think i don't i've never been to like a writer's retreat i've never taken writing in school i remember in fact my gosh in supposed to be graduating high school in three days and the teacher said i love your character descriptions but i think you need to stay after school for gram grammatic grammar grammar whatever it is Uh grammatical whatever it is grammar crap yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's great. I'm graduating in three days, and I'm off. But right on that. I love to write, and I taught myself to write, so it's okay. There you go. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of did the same thing. I, I, th- I think I started writing early as a coping mechanism. You know, it, the world is coming at you hard, and sometimes you're, if your parents aren't stable, you know, as a child, you can't handle it. You don't have a way to handle it, and it's overwhelming. And, you know, a lot of people shut stuff out of their memory. You know, they forget about stuff till later. And I guess according to the psychologist, what that means is that your, your, your brain says, hey, you can't handle this right now, man. This is way too much for us to cope with. So we're, gonna, we're just going to go ahead and put this aside. Or I think in your case, you know, uh, let's write. And that, that makes it so that you can cope with it and all that good stuff. And that makes all the difference. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I, I do remember, too, I would paint. I was always oh. a painter. Like in third grade, I was the only one allowed in this gifted program to be allowed to paint all day long at the easel and somehow I would be able to raise my hand. Mm -hmm. But once they took the easel away, that was it. It was like I was shut I was shut off. But that's like a cre I think if you have creative you have the need to create, that's Mm -hmm. a big part of it. I think that's maybe where the cathartic solace comes from is by creating you feel like you're expressing yourself and 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 it's also kind of it's also it's cathartic it's just kind of like you you go through it and you're you're just you're just sitting there going oh this feels good you know and and instead of like i found if i get angry about something sometimes it's good to just to write it out and then throw it away (laughs) yeah and then and then too i think it's oxytocin when you complete like a body of work and you read it and you're like oh I wrote that, man, that's awesome. I love it. Man, wow. You know, that <laughs> that too is, is very good. And to get the, like you write it down once, but literally I must have rewritten this at least 25 times because mm-hmm. you go back in, it's just like a canvas. Mm-hmm. When you fill up every single a spec on the canvas, now is when you're starting to really create. Yeah. Yeah. So I think then you're getting, no, that's not exactly how I mean it. I need to fix that. I need to really get in the moment and you can get lost. It's a great way of escape too. You can mm-hmm. get lost. I was reading this thing about creative people and one of the, one of the, the, the uh, one of the hallmarks of people that are the most highly creative and successful at it, they're usually procrastinators. And so oh. like the people that, you know, they do well. They'll get, you know, you give them a project. They're okay. They're they're like, I'm on it. All right, working on that project. You know, they're down the road. Meanwhile, people like me, I don't know, it might be people like you. We're just kind of fucking around. You know, we're just kind of, well, well kind of, I'm going to go over here and maybe do this over there. And I always thought I was being a procrastinator because I'm like, I just, God, what are you doing, dude? Right? You know, I'm procrastinating. Stop it. But what what evidently we're doing is we're looking for the creative thing. We're, 
you're, we're asking our subconscious mind to bring us something, and we're trying to find some inspiration too. So that's part of it. We're also kind of, let's see if you know, let me, let me find an inspiration, you know, and there's something that will trigger us into that sort of creative process that we need. And that's why we're more successful at being creative by being oh. procrastinators. Oh. oh, I think, I don't, I wonder if I, I don't think my mind ever shuts off, honestly, even yeah. if I'm watching a show, I might not know what the show is about. Mm-hmm. I, I will space out because I'm like, oh, you know, that's what I need to put in there. And then this is what goes there. And, oh, I got to go back. And I have to walk around with a paper and pen wherever, wherever I am. I got to have that. So that I can go ahead if I'm playing Mahjong. Oh, that's a good idea. I got to write that down. <laughs> it's it's while we are not physically maybe getting ready so, the way somebody else does. Mm-hmm. I think they put this label procrastinator. I think we, maybe we're still working, but in our artistic way. I'd rather yeah. say that. There you go. I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that meets right there in the middle of what I was saying. There you go. Yeah. Now, so you've incorporated a lot of this into the book. Let's get back to the book and talk about some of the characters in there. Oh, and sure. now, did you see that some of the characters were based on your life? Or yeah, they're life? all. It's just all true. The whole, they're hundred okay. percent true. Everybody's passed away, so I don't even. I don't use last names, but everybody in there. That's that was their name. I fully give character descriptions. Uh, it, it starts. See, what I did not know is when I started writing my book, I did not know that it would really have to go back to my mother's history. because I was so much just raised to be a people pleaser, just to please her until I went to college, you know, to survive. The therapist said, I remember the first question, so what do you do to be happy? And I said, I have to make my mother happy. That makes me happy. And that was the first time I, he says, no, that's not. You have homework. <laughs> you have homework, yeah. That's your first assignment. So the characters is my mother is actually the sinner. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Because I do write about a monster, but then my grandmother, who is the saint in the story, she explains at the last part in the last um what do you call it, chapter of the book, that the difference between a monster and a sinner is a sinner hurts an innocent person. And she was hurting me, who is an innocent person being a child. Yeah. Whispers is the main character, I think, because he is the character that whispers in my ear. And that's how I call him Whispers. And he always whispers oh. in my right ear. So oh. I've been told that could be like an angel. Huh. There you go. So angels and saints, or saints yeah. and saints and let's see, let me get sinners. The title sinners and saints, but you know the saints can be an angel too. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. I don't like this. So would you call this a semi autobiography or a fictional bi- autobiography or an autobiography? Oh, it's an would autobiography. Yeah, novel? it's stuff. Yes. autobiographical novel. Yes, maybe? it's written like a novel. It's mm-hmm. not written like most autobiographies, and it's a historical because I go through, you know, there's a lot of history. I go through, I talk about communism, and I talk mm-hmm. about the Nazism, and I talk mm-hmm. about what my family went through, I mean, in, in, but in a different kind of way, uh, like that they were the poorest Jews that there was, and they, there are mistakes that they've made in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Holocaust, the Nazis didn't help. Anyway, yeah, that right. that was a, a sad thing. Yeah, yeah. And and there, there, I mean, there's damage from that tragedy. There's trauma, right? There you go. And there's, and you know that it probably influenced your mother to behave in not the best manner towards you. Oh, right? yeah, I do write that a lot of people would say, you know, her quirkiness was due to that, mm-hmm. and I'm still out about that. I don't like to, I kind of teeter totter because she had. More, I think it's more of what was handed down in the family. Yeah. Her father, her grandfather, because she was a bastard child. I, it's just, I guess, I mean, I mean, I'm authentic. I say it the way it is. Yeah. She, grandma, love her, beautiful girl, but she fell in love with a royal and she got royally screwed. Let's say, put oh. it that way, part of me. But the my mother never knew who her father was. I mean, knew her the father. And he was royalty, blue blood, while they were, you know, 
living in poverty. Poverty, they lived in the ghetto before the ghetto got circled as being the ghetto. Yeah. Yeah, but the going back to she had Asperger and she had tentacles of explosive disorder okay. and I describe her grand her fa- her grandfather her yeah. grandfather as having episodes of very bad explosive disorder. Wow. A generational yeah. trauma passed down. Yeah, passed generational. Down, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know that's it's the sad part, but you know the great thing is is you've you've put a stop to that. You said, "Hey, we're not going to keep keep this pain passed down generation to generation." And I think a lot more people need to think about it that way and and to see if they can stop. You know, everyone needs to go to therapy. I think after COVID, pretty much at this point, <laughs> so I think that's where I'm at. You know, it's, it seems, I, including me. I'm not above. I'm not above it. Although I, I think I do a lot of trauma. I get a lot of psychologists on the show. That's my trick pony. Oh. I get to I get to talk to them before the show and during the show and after the show, and then they get to sit there and be and you know usually I'll see them ordering boats or something off of the advice they're having to give me and by the hour. So they're like, I'm going to buy my new yacht now that I see how damaged Chris is. <laughs> oh wow. Wow! So there nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought a few boats for a psychiatrist. That and strippers too. The put it through college. That's a joke. People just roll with it. We're from Vegas. The what else about the book that's inside of it that we need to know? Huh? Other than that, the the, the that all negatives that negatives are not negatives. To look at a negative, like when you get pushed. To not just say, and, and you see this, a lot of people, oh, you know, they get wimpy and they get whiny and then they leave it at that. I'm hurt. And they leave it at that because they don't look for the tools to say, why would, why don't I see it that it's that person, that's their personality. Mm-hmm. And why do I need to keep going back to that person and keep taking it instead Life is pushing me in a different direction and showing me that I belong somewhere else. You know, this is, this is what I think is very important. There's so many subtle hints that the universe, if you keep an eye open, that you can see that be more attuned to. I, I know this is a very much of a, you know, a money, 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 money. I got to have money kind of society. Mm. But, you know, a lot of people are not happy. So I think that there's some kind of balance. And after, of course, you have to put food on the table. This is obviously a necessity. But then what about, what are you doing? Going back to the first question, what are you doing to be happy? Are you grateful? And if you are grateful, what are you grateful for? Is it, is it fall under, oh, people are looking at me. I'm very important. Mm-hmm. Then you got ego and, you know, look at what your obscurations are. What is it that's defining you? What did you do for somebody else today? Even mm-hmm. as simple as walking down the street, somebody smiled at you. You didn't turn your head, but you smiled back. That's huge. Yeah. Just being nice to people and good to them. Definitely. It's, it's the, the most simplest things is just is just huge. Just being kind and courteous, and and if you're not, then maybe see maybe there's something I need to do to change that. You know, mm-hmm. look at those signs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So now the other two books, I think you said you're working on. How do those fit into the scheme of all of this? Yeah, they are sequels. Okay. They are sequels. Yeah. So we're going to so, tell your whole life story by the time we're done then, right? Or up to yeah. That. Yeah. Pretty much mine and everybody else's that I've met in my life. <laughs> there you go. There yeah. You go. I think everybody has a story. And I think, you know, that's what really people are in our lives is so that we can learn who we are, mm-hmm. what it is that we don't like about somebody else. Why is that bothering us? Sometimes we have that in ourselves and it bothers us. Mm-hmm. So therefore we need to change that. Yeah. And that's there what people go. are for, to learn our, yeah. our, ourself. That's what we always say on the show, stories of the owner's manuals to life. It's uh, stories of the fabric of who we are. They really are. Even though, you know, sometimes we don't have the best stories, we, but we definitely take a look at, you know, what our stories are and then 
try and figure out how to make the best of them or to survive. Sometimes it's just survival. Sometimes it's a matter of just knowing that you're not alone in the universe and that other people maybe went through what you did and they survived. And so maybe they have a blueprint that you can survive with. You know, all these different things make a difference. And so we always talk about that on the show. I mean, stories are everything. It's yeah. how we learn. It's how we teach each other. It's how we educate. Yeah. It's how we entertain and all that good stuff. So it'll be exciting to see what's the uh, what's the dates that these uh, new books might come out. I'm on I'm in queue with my editor for the second book and I'm I'm almost done with the third book so it's kind of 25 was when I'm going to see the second book come out and then I have to be in queue and wait. Mm -hmm. But it, the second book is done, that's written and it goes more into paranormal actually, which is very mm -hmm. interesting because being you know, with whispers and and having, mm, knowing things ahead of time, what happens in my second book is I predict somebody's death and at first, you know, who I have to tell, it's going to cost me my life and they were going to put me in a booby hatch. That's what we called it back then or a loony bin, right? Oh. So, like the within two weeks, then they started to look at me and go, okay, I think we have to start to look at you in a different kind of way. Mm. And then I, I predict certain things and, and I continue doing that. I still do that today. I can, I, for some reason I'm able to do that and I could read pictures and, and the fourth book will, will be all out just all my paranormal experiences, like a whole bunch of them too. You know, I think that there is so many horror movies. I watch horror movies and I'm like, this is not how it is. I don't understand. What are they do? Why do they do this? Why do they make it so scary for regular people? No wonder people say, oh, my God, aren't you scared when that happens? And I go, no, no, I'm not scared because I know if it's a bad entity, I'm not bothering with it. It's got to go. But if it's a good entity, I can help it pass over and, and move on. And I think that there's a big, big loophole in knowing the honest, make it unscary, make it like, you know, when you don't know your next door neighbor and you have all these thoughts maybe, but mm -hmm. then when you meet them, you're like, oh, They're not bad. Yeah. you're just like me. It's no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. There you go. So it should be fun to see these new books come out from you. People can follow along. Give us your final thoughts as we go out. Tell people to pitch out where to buy the book and, of course, a link where they can find you on the interwebs. Okay, great. So you can find me at nancyhart.com. My books are will be available and are available. The first one is available through Amazon. Just go to Whisper Sinners and Saints or Nancy Hart, and there I will be. There you go. Thank you very much, Nancy, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so very much. I very much appreciate meeting you and speaking to all your viewers. Thank you Pleasure. so very much. And we'll look forward to your next book. And to our audience, order the book wherever fine books are sold, Whispers, Sinners, and Saints, out March 18th, 2024. Refer your family, friends, and relatives to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and all those crazy places we're at on the Internet. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.